The Full Melt Show is intended for a mature audience. It contains adult themes, adult content, and sometimes adult language. Listener discretion is advised. The Full Melt. Marijuana dispensary owners faced another roadblock today as the city council considered an appeal against its original ordinance ruling that basically said four dispensaries could set up in an area. Fox 5's Elena Bovian joins us from downtown with the latest on the council's decision. Elena. Jen, Phil, good evening. Um, well, today the council members voted to deny 11 of those appeals, making today's meeting for some just another delay in making medical marijuana shops legal in San Diego. I would move uh, the, that we deny the appeal and uphold the environmental exemption determination. One by one, city council members and, uh, voted media. to deny an appeal set to stop the permitting for legal medical marijuana dispensaries within city limits. In a sense, it's a frivolous appeal. Last year, the city approved to have four dispensaries within each of the city districts. Along the way, it deemed any city-approved pot shop would operate in a retail space without making any new major changes to the building, thus making them exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. We will appeal every one of these every step of the way. Scott Chipman with San Diegans for Safe Neighborhoods did not file the appeal on Tuesday's agenda, but is requesting the city take a closer look at the approved ordinance, claiming marijuana, its sale and production are environmental issues. What we're here today to argue is that there are significant environmental impacts as a result of pot shops. Those include diverting streams and water, uh, killing animals, pesticides, using pesticides in the local forests. Uh, as well as the hash oil labs that we've had. Officials with the city's development services department found that CEQA regulations don't apply in the case of the dispensaries. A CEQA pertains to where there might, uh, where a land use may bring about a physical change in the environment, say harming endangered species or harming a historical, a historical building or uh, creating air pollution. Attorney Marianne Green represents one of the 11 dispensaries on the appeals list seeking provisional use permits. Green claims this process is just a waste of time. And so that's why they're, it, that's why these operations are exempt because they're simple retail operations with no significant physical environmental effects. Now, the 11 applicants on the appeals list today are still not guaranteed that they will receive a permit. The city council members are still reviewing 40 applications before they grant the list of the stores that will have the conditional use permits. That's the latest from downtown. Phil, Jen, I'll send it back to you. All right, certainly a lot still to come on that story. Thanks so much. Elena. Are you high? What are you talking about? This is the full melt. Give me a break. The full melt show. A marijuana discussion about news, culture, politics, and lifestyle. Fullmelt.com. Toll free. 844-420-TALK. 844-420-TALK. So the question is, the question is, uh, who opposes medical marijuana? Who opposes legal cannabis? It seems that sometimes those people may be different. And sometimes they may be the same. So in other words, uh, you've got the people who are pro-cannabis, the people who say legalize, uh, the people say that nobody should go to jail for a plant, uh, the people that say there are medical conditions that benefit from the use of medical marijuana. And then there are the people that say, well, you know, I understand about medical marijuana. I get where you're going with that. Um, maybe we should make some allowance there. Let's talk about that. Let's enact some policy that accommodates medical marijuana. And then there, uh, but, but as far as it goes to the legal stuff, no, I'm opposed to the legal marijuana. We had uh, uh, a farmer on uh, from Florida who was talking about uh, the fact that blacks uh, were being uh, barred from participating in growing because that you're going to grow uh, the cannabis necessary to produce the only thing that we're going to call medical marijuana in this state, in Florida. Um, you've got to be in the history of a program for a long time. You've got to be a part of a group uh, that has traditionally not had access to uh, nurseries uh, or, or large farming agriculturally. Uh, there was a lawsuit over this. There was a whole show we did about this. So if you go, get a chance, go back and listen to that program. But uh, the guy that we interviewed... Um, who's a member of the National Farmers Association, uh, the Florida Farmers, Black Farmers Association. Um, 
said, look, I, I agree about the medical stuff, but when it, I'm not, I'm not on the, I don't like the, the recreational thing. That's not me. So I'm opposed to that. So there's that guy. And you've got people like him that say, I understand medical, but when you're talking about recreational, eh, I'm not convinced. Uh, I think that's a slippery slope. There's a problem there. And then you've got the people who are like, you know what? Legal marijuana does not exist in this country because federal law prohibits it. Because the FDA says, no, there's no medical use. It's a Schedule One substance. Uh, there's no medical benefit that we're going to recognize. Uh, there's not enough medical information in about this. Uh, and so I don't agree with medical marijuana or uh, with retail marijuana, especially. But either one, uh, those are both off the list. Uh, both no, no, no. And our guest on the uh, program... Uh, Mr. Chipman has formed a program uh, which is a political action uh, committee. Really, it's a PAC, uh, but it's also a nonprofit organization. It's called CALM, C-A-L-M. And uh, we'll get to what the, uh, that acronym, acronym stands for on its. Well, in fact, I'll have him explain the acronym to you. Uh, but it was founded uh, by Mr. Scott Chipman and William Lowe uh, back in March of 2010 to oppose Prop 19 in California. Um. Now, obviously, Prop 19 went down. Um, and so Mr. Chipman still has uh, this organization. Now, call, uh, Calm calls upon the state legislature, county governments, and local municipalities to work within the current federal law and to join with federal agencies to stop the spread of marijuana distribution and use of any kind. Uh, Calm is an all-volunteer political action committee. A number of organizations stand behind Calm. According to their uh, information, uh, including uh, uh, the American Medical Association and anti-marijuana legalization, uh, the American Cancer Society, uh, as well as the British Medical Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, there are others, uh, they claim, that are with them on the anti-marijuana campaign. So uh, we want to explore this angle and see uh, what uh Mr. Chipman has to say about his organization, about what it means, about why he's behind this effort, and uh, what he's doing in California, where they're at. Because, you know, there's another legal prop going down there in, in California. Uh, there's a proposition uh, that may be coming forth uh, pretty soon. And so, um, you know, this is going to be on the ballot in the fall. Of 2016, I believe, if the people that want to legalize uh, marijuana in California have their way about this. If Mr. Chipman has his way, uh, not only would that not happen, uh, but they would do everything they can uh, to roll back anything medical marijuana in the state of California. Uh, that seems to be his position. I'll let him speak for himself. I try not to speak for people. I'm just telling you what I'm aware of. Uh, from uh, both the, the, you know, publicly available information and, uh, you know, the news of the day, what's happening in the state of California. Uh, so if you go to uh, Citizens Against Legalizing Marijuana, so I let the cat out of the bag. That's the name of his organization, Calm. Uh, right on the front page, it says the DEA and the federal government are not alone in viewing smoked marijuana as having no documented medical value. Voices in the medical community likewise do not accept the smoked marijuana as medicine. So they talk about the AMA uh, and their position. Uh, they talk about ASAM, which is the American Society of uh, Addiction Medicine. Uh, also, uh, the ACS, the American Cancer Society. The AGS, which is the American Glaucoma Society. The American Academy of Patriotics, or AAP. Also, the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, he says, uh, according to Calm's um, website, and the British American Medical Association, which I previously had mentioned. Um, so he says the following organizations have endorsed voting no to marijuana legalization in California. And there is a quite a list there. Uh, he talks about different people and different organizations, including uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving the California Narcotics Officers Association, the California Police Chiefs Association, uh, the California State Sheriff's Association, 
and the California District Attorneys Association. Uh, also, uh, U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein, who's been quite vocal about her opposition uh, to legal marijuana and sometimes medical marijuana. San Francisco District Attorney uh, Kamala Harris, a Democrat, and Los Angeles District Attorney Steve Cooley, a Republican. A Democratic gubernatorial nominee Jerry Brown and Republican gubernatorial nominee Meg Whitman. Uh, so there's this long list of people. Um, and, you know, I'm just going to answer this call while I'm on the air. Uh, Jamie, you're going to have to call the 800 number. Uh, you can't call the cell phone while I'm on the air. I'm on the air right now, 844-420-TALK. You'll have to call that line or text me because I can't talk to you while I'm on the air. I'm sorry. So, um, uh, Jamie is uh, a dispensary runner. He he, he uh, runs part of dispensary in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, actually, it's not Ann Arbor. I take that back. I, I have to, you know, sometimes I confuse Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti by proximity. <laughs> um, it's Ypsilanti, Michigan. It's the Third Coast Compassion Center. So I thought Jamie may have uh, an opposing point of view on this and uh, may be able to help uh, wrangle any opposing point of view. Uh, considering this program is a live program and you have the opportunity to call, I'll open up the phone number to you now. However, I probably will not be taking any calls uh, from people calling the phone number uh, until after the 730 break. Uh, Mr. Chipman, I want to have an opportunity to explain his position and uh, what his organization's about, uh, the who, what, where, when and why. And then after he's had an opportunity to go over all of that between, say, 715 and 730, uh, I'll invite you to call in at one 420 talk Now, uh, the program also exists as a podcast after we're off the air, and you can find us on iTunes, uh, a number of podcast directories, including iTunes, uh, Spreaker, uh, stonerradio.com, uh, and hopefully uh, sometime soon some replays on the Russ Belleville uh, replays that happen throughout uh, 420radio.org. Uh, so, uh there will be no opportunity for people who listen to the after show, the podcast version of this program, uh, to engage on this subject. And uh, being that the program doesn't exist until we push the button to say, hey, we're live, we're on the air, I want to make sure that uh, if you're going to participate, if you want to have a chance to feedback and, and say why maybe you agree with Mr. Chipman or maybe why you don't agree with Mr. Chipman, uh, 844-420-TALK. Uh, we'll let you have your say about it at 730. Uh, if you're listening to the program live now, alert your friends. Let them know. And we'll be right back with Scott Chipman from Calm out of San Diego, California, right next on this very program. Don't go away. You're getting the full melt. You know, it's not easy out there, but it can be easier. And when it comes to medical marijuana in Michigan and chronic pain management, Dr. Bob Townsend, renowned for his patient advocacy and deep understanding of how patients and medical marijuana certifications fit together, makes it his hallmark to educate and provide the best holistic treatment for your condition. Now, his knowledgeable staff makes you feel warm and welcome. And Dr. Bob makes you feel well. With locations across the state in Cadillac and Gaylord, Kalamazoo, Marquette, Mount Pleasant, Muskegon, Saginaw, Traverse City, you can't beat the convenience and feeling you get knowing you have someone on your side that can Cares. Denali Healthcare is on the web at DenaliHealthCareMI.com. Get answers to your holistic health questions or schedule an appointment now by calling 989 339 4464. Chronic pain management and holistic health answers is what they do. It's all they do. DenaliHealthCareMI.com. Get your certification and peace of mind now by making an appointment with Dr. Bob Townsend at 989 339 4464. Got something to hide? Canalock offers discreet and effective storage solutions that destroy odor, so nobody knows. Canalock is a patented charcoal activated bag that discreetly stores your marijuana. Canalock is made from the same material as military chemical warfare suits. Get yours at canalock.com. Visit canalock.com to learn more about no smell technology. They're parasites. They've got no contribution to this society. They're preying on our community and our kids. It's going to end badly. He's got exactly $100,000 in cash in the back of his car. I bet there's guys right there in that prison for doing just what we're about to do. I want the Breckenridge Cannabis Club to be a household name. This is us pioneering a new industry. 
He's going after every resort town in Colorado. His plan is brilliant. This is a big boy operation now. We are not the Amsterdam of the Rockies. We're Breckenridge. Absolutely unbelievable to us that this has happened so quickly. That's when the town erupted. All hell can break loose. I think we have an image to protect. The powerful Ooh. elite has definitely put the pressure on. Everyone is playing everyone. They're going to have a target painted on their back. That is a real threat. There's $2 billion to be had next year. I plan to take more than my fair share. High Profits, Sunday night at 10 Eastern on CNN. Does your dog or cat suffer with joint disorders, arthritis, anxiety, cancer, chronic pain, or other ailments? Hemp or cannabis-based medicinal products are now legal. Why should your pets go without the same options that we have available? Try Satibis, a daily hemp oil with CBD. Satibis is quality inspected and made in the USA. Easy to use drops are applied directly to your pet's food. For your pet's wellness, try Satibis Drops. Ask for Satibis at your local pet store or learn more at PetPain.com. With this warmer weather, I get more active. Headaches and pains keep me from doing things I enjoy, like golfing and working outside my yard. Toledo Hemp Center's new location, 1415 Sylvania Avenue, has shown me there is an alternative to pharmaceutical drugs. I use CBD, cannabidiol, infused hemp lotions, oral sprays, and topical oils. Thank you, Toledo Hemp Center, for helping me restore and maintain my health with no side effects and no high. Find out more at ToledoHempCenter.com. It's the Full Melt Radio Show. Radio Show. I'm sorry for everything, know everything I've done. So our subject on the program today is medical marijuana, cannabis, hemp. Well, you know what? That's our subject on the program every day. Uh, there are people who are for. There are people who are against. Uh, both legal and... And, uh, you know, medical marijuana and then what we would call, I guess, retail cannabis or some people would refer to as recreational marijuana. Uh, One of the people opposed to uh, any kind of uh, cannabis in America, I believe, uh, and I'll let him speak for himself, is uh, Mr. Scott Chipman, who uh, formed the organization called Calm. Welcome to the program, Scott. Well, thanks for having me. And uh, I have to say, we're not opposed to the plant. We're opposed to how it's being described and used as medicine, and of course, we're we're opposed to the psych, the, uh, you know, in it, the psychotropic, uh, psychoactive, addictive, dangerous drug, which is THC. Um, how can you not be opposed to the plant? What would that mean if you're not opposed to the plant, but you're opposed to the way it's being characterized? Well, I mean, we could say we're opposed to. Um, opiate opium but we're not opposed to the use of ingredients out of the uh, poppy plant as uh, medicine but you know just like the poppy is not considered medicine uh, the marijuana plant or the cannabis plant is also not medicine so um, there is, uh, for the poppy plant, if I'm not mistaken, um, there is a dual scheduling. So uh, the poppy plant itself, the plant, uh, the poppy plant that's known to produce opiates, because uh, it's a very specific uh, species of the poppy plant, if I'm not mistaken, um, is outlawed uh, if you can't grow it. Um, and, and you certainly aren't going to give any permission to have it um, because the plant itself, the whole plant, is illegal under American law. Right? right am I correct? I believe you're right. And then uh, the prescription form of the uh, deductions from opium uh, in the form of opiates, um, analgesic pain medications, uh, including Vicodin and other uh, familiar names, um, those are legal because of of why? Well, because the FDA has done studies that indicate they have medicinal value. Right, Uh, so they've been through... The FDA continues to reaffirm year after year that... The smoked marijuana has no medicinal value. Right. So we're getting back to the, the dual scheduling of, uh, you know, opiates as a whole. Uh, so the whole plant is illegal, um, but the uh, FDA has done clinical trials uh, through uh, people that have, you know, broken the plant down into its supposed medical value and uh, used that those extracts, those 
pieces of the opium plant um, medicinally. And so they've, they've, they've proven through these clinical trials, through the scientific process, uh, that this has uh, not only medical value, but it's effective and it's safe. Correct. If it's used properly, obviously, there's a lot of misuse of opiates and a lot of other pharmaceuticals. Now, there's basically there's five criteria for determining if um, an element is a medicinal. And the FDA uses that. We've had the FDA process around for, I think, a uh, hundred years or more. It served us very well, but for some reason, now uh, we've got the equivalent of snake oil of people saying, oh, I, I've got this plant. You can put it in drinks. You can bathe in it. You can eat it. You can smoke it. And it's got medicinal value. And, and really, this is <laughs> it's a very unsafe practice. And for most people, it's basically hiding behind the idea that marijuana is medicine to justify legalization and recreational use. So, um, so would, would you say, uh, under your opinion, if the, w- would it be important if there is medicinal value to uh, the components in marijuana that there should be clinical trials done and they should perhaps reschedule it the same way that they do with the uh, treat the opium plant, where it's, it's dual classification. The whole plant is illegal, uh, but the FDA stuff is, it could be used as medicine. Absolutely. We're not opposed to the FDA process. As a matter of fact, that's what, we're call- what's what we've been calling for. But it's interesting, the legalizers generally, uh, well, I'm from California, so you can judge that for what it's worth. Okay. Um, the legalizers don't call, they're not calling for the FDA process to, to, uh, to they're basically saying legalize pot because we, we should be just distributing it through the air conditioning system. It's good for everything. You're right. <laughs> So you're saying that there's a that there's an overt problem. Uh, not only is uh, the way that the medical cannabis is used in California currently, uh, not only is that a farce because uh, there's no uh, proof that any of this is useful. Am I correct so far? That's correct. But also that, um, uh, well, I guess I don't know what the also is. Uh, well, I had... the, but also it's harmful. You know. So you, look, we in California, and let, by the way, I have two medical marijuana recommendations myself. Uh, I could get a dozen in in three hours if I wanted to spend the money. Uh, no doctor was present. Uh, they basically, I, I went into a little office space. Uh, there was a desk and a uh, receptionist, and the receptionist said, what's your problem? I said, pain, and they wrote chronic pain and printed out the forms, and the doctor's signatures were pre-printed on the forms. There was no examination, and uh, there was no discussion about the side effects or the dangers or what marijuana sh- I should use, no potency, no duration, no frequency. Just go get pot, use it as much as you want, buy as much as you want, as often as you want, from as many locations as you want, and you're good to go. Uh, so you're saying there's no doctor certification required in your state? Well, required and what's really practiced are two different things. In my experience, and Our coalition, that's what we do. Uh, We've got a local coalition here in San Diego where I am called San Diego for Safe Neighborhoods. We monitor the pot shops as they open and uh, file the complaints and get them closed down. But uh, we've got the advertising in in the local magazines, you know, street corner free magazines. And you look and you say, oh, Dr. X has seven phone numbers. And you call up every one of those phone numbers. Are you open? Yes. You know, can I come in and see the doctor? Yeah, but you can come in, and I can get you a recommendation. But, you know, the doctor will only see if you have questions. So basically, it's just a receptionist in a little office, and they get 50 to $100, and, uh, and they write you out a recommendation with the doctor's signature. It's not practicing medicine. These are basically scofflaws. Uh, now, it's not done that way everywhere, is it? It's just in California that they have the, dis- <laughs> the way that you've described this, correct? Well, I, yeah. I mean, California for, was first and did it the worst, as, you know, basically. First and the worst. Um, I like that. That's a, that's a, you coined a phrase, first and the worst. Yeah, so, um, you know, it was, it was billed, Prop 215, that is, was billed as, we just want seriously ill, dying people to get marijuana if they think it hel- it's helpful. Nobody cares, right? But the reality is there was a little phrase in there, and the interpretation was, if, mar- if you think marijuana helps you, 
for any reason, go get it. So, by the way, selling marijuana in California is still illegal by state law. Um, and But everybody just kind of says, well, you know, the, the voters voted for people to get access to marijuana. How are they going to get it? Well, there was a way to, for them to get it without having storefronts. That was with a closed-circuit situation where a caregiver uh, or another patient grows it and distributes it, you know, hand-to-hand to, hand to, hand to another patient. And, uh, and there's uh, uh, attorney general guidelines that if they were followed, we would have uh, almost no uh, illegal buying of marijuana in California. But, you know, the, the state is very inept at enforcing and applying its laws effectively to protect, to, to protect society. And so, consequently, we have a huge amount of diversion to young people. The, er, the, the age of introduction to marijuana, it really state, it, nationwide, but particularly in California, is 12. That's when children are exposed, may have their first exposure to access to marijuana. Is that a and national I, figure or is that a California figure you're using there? I think it's a national figure, but it's definitely a California figure. <clears throat> uh, but this is the, you know, are there some isolated uh, areas where, you know, kids and, and communities are well, uh, much better protected than California, in the typical neighborhoods, I'm sure. But th there should be a serious concern because if your show has covered any of the research related to young uh, adolescent use of marijuana, you know that it has dramatic impacts on the brain, and these are long-lasting. Addiction is much more uh, likely if the younger you use, the more you use, the more likely you are to, to get uh, uh, have a psychotic uh, malady, schizophrenia, depression, thoughts of suicide. Uh, and so, you know, one of our biggest concerns is that people don't realize the impact on the brain. Brain's not fully developed until about 25. Now they're thinking it's more like 28. Uh, more most recent studies. So if you're using marijuana and you're under the age of 25, you're still making brain connections, and the and the THC itself is going to interfere with properly with those connections being properly formed. Uh, don't you find that alcohol is an equally pro problematic issue for young people in general? <laughs> Yeah, it is, but it's no less or more than marijuana. People, if kids, you know, anybody under 20 years of age now says, "Do you smoke?" They're not talking about cigarettes. They're talking about they're talking about marijuana. Sure. So you know, so the fact that that alcohol is a has a a huge impact on our society should not give us uh, uh, a comfort that marijuana is somehow going to change that. No, it, we, the 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 studies indicate that people don't stop drinking alcohol because they do marijuana. They do both, and both are additive and, and have even more serious impacts. What studies and, are you, wait, uh, wait, 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 yeah. you're, just, you're saying studies say. What studies are you talking about as opposed you know, when you're talking about people uh, not giving up uh, alcohol for marijuana? Because I would think uh, just in my own uh, personal experience with people that that has been the case. People who used to use a lot of alcohol, once they find marijuana, choose not to go to a lot of alcohol. Well, even if you say, well, they're going to use marijuana instead of alcohol, and I could, you know, this is a cold call. I don't have all my paperwork in front of me. I'm That's okay. I'm you from, just asking. Uh, from work. So, you know, I'm gonna, I'd be happy to forward that on to you. Give me your email. But this is the, the bigger concern. we got 60% of the population plus uh, using alcohol. Right. And only about 10 percent of those people uh, have a drinking problem, you know, are regularly uh, drunk. Uh, so and that is a huge impact on our society. Well, sure. The um, drunk people, they cause uh, lots of drunk driving accidents. There's all kinds of problems uh, with alcohol. Would you agree? Well, yeah. And there's a lots of drug driving accidents. They're dramatically on the rise and. So you've got a significant and increasing number of people who are involved in drugged driving fatality accidents who now test positive for marijuana. And, you know, it's interesting. I get calls from marijuana users well, all wait, the wait, time. Wait, because, wait, let me ask you this, because you're, uh, just as long as we're expanding on that, uh, uh, you know, the drunk driving thing or, you know, the drugged driving yeah. thing. Um, right. You know, it seems that uh, they will test people for things like marijuana because it's a Schedule One substance. They would probably also test them for things like cocaine or methamphetamine. 
They don't test them for the opiates you're talking about, but yet you could be just as impaired with prescription opiates in a vehicle, and they're not being tested for that. Doesn't that skew the statistics about drug driving? Well, I, you know, I, you'd have to go into each individual state and say, what are they testing for? But the one thing that is for sure is the, the number of people who are testing positive for marijuana is going up dramatically. And just in my own county, which I, I've got most familiar with, 48% of criminals who are arrested, not arrested for marijuana, not arrested for drugs, arrested for some other action, uh, test positive for marijuana. So, yeah, did the marijuana cause them to do the, uh, the criminal act? That's debatable, depends. But, you know, my point being is that nobody makes better decisions while they're on marijuana right. than they do uh, when, they're not, when they're not using marijuana. But it's interesting, when I get calls from people who, uh, who are drug users, who are marijuana users, I ask them, well, aren't you concerned about the drug driving? The typical answer is, no way. I drive so much better when I'm on marijuana. And, you know, the indication is that high and eye coordination, judgment, uh, memory, uh, perception, time perception, all these things are seriously impacted um, by marijuana use. And yet somehow the perception of these uh, uh, marijuana drivers is that they drive better under the influence of marijuana. And I'll tell you why that is. Because marijuana impacts the part of the brain that you use to assess yourself. Okay, so let me ask you this: as we're getting ready to come to a commercial break, um, okay. so we got a, you know about a minute or two left before the break. Um, when it comes to, I think uh, we can get uh, get agreements from everybody on this topic uh, uh, regarding driving uh, that you shouldn't be operating a vehicle when you're impaired by anything. Would you agree? Oh yes. Yeah. So um, I guess the question that I would like to explore a little bit on the other side of the break um, is. When are you impaired? Because it seems that with alcohol, which is a single-chain molecule, it's predictable in everyone. Whereas marijuana, which is a three-chain molecule, THC, uh, seems to have a different impact uh, based on, you know, you can't draw a line the same way you can with alcohol. In other words, some, somebody may have consumed marijuana, but not necessarily be impaired. So let's think about that for a second. We'll come back on the other side of the break. Our guest is Mr. Scott Chipman of Calm out in San Diego, California. We'll explore this topic a little bit more on the other side. Stand by. You're getting the full milk. It started with Weed 1. Some have called it a watershed moment. Then came Weed 2. It's absurd that we would have to do this to get medicine. Now Dr. Sanjay Gupta is at it again, and he's reaching higher than ever with Weed 3. I never thought I would be smoking weed in the hospital. The movement behind it. We demand this plant go through the process of the FDA. The radical research. I have to say I'm kind of stunned. Weed 3, the marijuana revolution. Each week, Pot Pitch takes a look at different medical or legal pot business as they attempt to seek investment capital and partners in order to take their business to the next level. What do investors like? Entrepreneurs are shown the door. Real venture capitalists, smart entrepreneurs, and exciting business models in a brand new industry. Cannabis. Pot pitch. Find out what this new marijuana industry will look like and who its players will be. Real deals, real people, real decisions. Pot pitch at potpitch.com and featured on the Full Melt Radio Show. Got something to hide? Canalock offers discreet and effective storage solutions that destroy odor, so nobody knows. Canalock is a patented charcoal activated bag that discreetly stores your marijuana. Canalock is made from the same material as military chemical warfare suits. Get yours at canalock.com. Visit canalock.com to learn more about no smell technology. Does your dog or cat suffer with joint disorders, arthritis, anxiety, cancer, chronic pain, or other ailments? Hemp or cannabis based medicinal products are now legal. Why should your pets go without the same options that we have available? Try Satibis, a daily hemp oil with CBD. Satibis is quality inspected and made in the USA. Easy to use drops are applied directly to your pet's food. For your pet's wellness, try Satibis Drops. Ask for Satibis at your local pet store or learn more at PetPain.com. With this warmer weather, I get more active. 
that aches and pains keep me from doing things I enjoy, like golfing and working outside my yard. Toledo Hemp Center's new location, 1415 Sylvania Avenue, has shown me there is an alternative to pharmaceutical drugs. I use CBD, cannabidiol, infused hemp lotions, oral sprays, and topical oils. Thank you, Toledo Hemp Center, for helping me restore and maintain my health with no side effects and no high. Find out more at ToledoHempCenter.com. Hey, this is Tommy Chong, and you're listening to the Full Milk Show. My heart is uh, so we're talking about uh, the impairment value of marijuana and uh, medical marijuana and retail marijuana in general. Is this something we should allow? Is it not something we should allow? Our guest is Mr. Scott Chipman from CALM. Can you tell everybody, uh, Scott, what CALM stands for? I'm sorry. Yes, Citizens Against Legalizing Marijuana. We have a statewide coalition, and we assist other coalitions to oppose legalization in their state. Now, before we get back to the issue we were talking about before the break, which is impaired driving, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your organization and uh, what made you form it? Yeah, we got started, well, first of all, in my community, uh, we had a bunch of stores selling drug paraphernalia. We realized it was illegal to sell drug paraphernalia, and why do we have 20 stores selling it? And then we had stores opening selling marijuana, and they were all illegal, uh, it connected me to other people across the state who had the similar concerns. In 2008, 2009, we realized it was likely going to be on the ballot in California in 2010. So we started a statewide coalition to oppose legalization. That was Prop uh, 19, and we defeated Prop 19 in California back in 2010. And, of course, we're preparing now to defeat legalization in California in 2016. Um, and I listed a bunch of, uh, before I had the benefit of calling you on the, on the phone and getting you on the program, I listed um, in the preface to our interview uh, the organizations uh, on your website uh, that are part of that coalition. Am I correct? Well, it's expanding. I'm not even sure I could remember half of them. But, uh, there's a, uh, it's, a, it's a large group. Yeah, and if you go back to Prop 19 and look at who opposed legalization in California back in 2010, it was a very large group. And in April, people say, oh, well, it's going to become legalized everywhere. You know, why are we even fighting it? But if you go back to April of 2010, pot legalization in California was polling at 55% in favor. By November, it, that was completely reversed, and it was defeated 55-45. So uh, you're pre- completely prepared to help defeat this uh, uh, in the next election cycle, 2016, during the presidential election cycle? Well, prepared, uh, you know, that the... <laughs> There's, that's a, a uh, relative term. Okay. We are preparing, have been preparing, okay. we're educating. Um, you know, one of the things we need to do is talk more about marijuana and its harms. You know, people uh, think that uh, based on what they hear on the media, well, it's not really that harmful, but it is. It's a very serious uh, drug, and there's 120 people in the United States every day who die of overdosing on some drug. Now, everyone say, well, nobody's dying of marijuana, are they? Virtually every one of those people went through marijuana before they, they went to the point of addictions to much more serious. So it's both a, uh, it's a gateway drug, both socially and chemically. Well, wouldn't you say that the gateway issue is the fact that marijuana is in there because it's lumped in with the illegal drug group, that you're going to go to the illegal place if you're going to obtain marijuana, so you've got this access to all these other drugs. Wouldn't you say that's the what, case? Where is that illegal place? Is it down at the boardwalk? Is it in a store? In, I'm just, in saying, I'm just saying it doesn't, it doesn't, they're everywhere. Uh, I'm just saying it seems like that if you're going to get an illegal substance, you're going to have to go to a drug dealer, and the drug dealer may have other things than marijuana. Wouldn't that be the gateway? <laughs> Well, no, uh, that's actually not what's borne out in the, in our observations in California. There are people who just deal marijuana, okay. and yeah, if you want if you if you were, get to the point where you're making bad decisions, then you may say, oh, well, now I'm I'm ready for something else. Let's go to hash oil. Let's go to stronger hash oil. Let's go. Oh, now it's getting expensive. Let's go to heroin. You know, so you know people do progress in this thing, and it, you know, and yes, not everyone progresses, uh, but. Um, okay. four to five times more people who use marijuana do progress uh, to much heavier drugs than those who don't. So you're, you're part of the slippery slope crowd. You believe that the, this is a slippery slope to other things. It's a gateway. You're, this is a bad place, is what you're saying. Well, it's, there's a slipper, slippery slope politically as well as, um, you know, in terms of public health. 
you know, all of the people who advocated for mar legalizing marijuana for medicinal purposes in California said, this is not about legalization. You know, they said that over and over and over again, and uh, a few of us were not fooled by that. And now, of course, uh, we, we see that this was nothing but the attempt. And as a matter of fact, pot supporters themselves said, if we can get it to be legalized, then we can get to be normalized in our society. I'm sorry, if we can get it to be medicalized, then we can get it to be normalized in our society, and we can get it to be legalized. That was the strategy all along. Isn't it a good strategy? Well, of course, there is. Uh, there, there made some progress, but you've got to realize, too, that less than 5% of the population of the United States with the legalization in Colorado, Washington, Alaska, and Oregon. Less than 5% of the population actually live in states that have legalized. And we're confident that in Ohio this November, they're going to defeat legalization for uh, dispensing marijuana as medicine as well as recreation. And that's got 9% of the population of the United States. So the, the inevitability of legalization is far from true. So um, we've been chomping at the bit here for a while. Uh, there are people that um, uh, want to chime in on the conversation. Would you be interested in entertaining any phone calls uh, from our listeners? Um, I know. Yeah, as, as long as they're questions where people actually want to know an answer and not just rail. Okay, I well, get plenty of that. So uh, we've got uh, Chuck Ream from Ann Arbor. Chuck, uh, hello. You're on the program. Are you there, Chuck? Yes, sir. So uh, do you have a question for our guest, Mr. Chipman, who is opposed to cannabis, uh, medical cannabis uh, as a whole, uh, because it hasn't been approved by the uh, FDA, and then is also opposed, obviously, to uh, legalizing marijuana in California or really anywhere else for that matter. Isn't that correct, Mr. Chipman? Yes. You had a question, Chuck? Well, it's very hard for me to frame a question. Um, this thing has been, this, this substance has been used for 6,000 years. And with me personally, I've got a, a stomach problem, and I can't use coffee or tea or alcohol or spicy food or tobacco or any of the kinds of things that people normally would use. And then on top of that, cannabis will settle my stomach to make me functional so that I can study and work. And I have three university degrees and taught kindergarten for 33 years and was an elected official five, elected five times uh, so, so, and have benefited so tremendously from my association with marijuana that it is difficult for me to frame a question other than why is this gentleman really doing this when this is an ancient and proven thing. That, that also, I mean, I can go through one by one any one of the things that he brought up. Criminality, I've got all the answers there. Driving. Uh, well, let's let's, pay, let's let's but since we didn't cover the driving thing, let's uh, let's revisit that because I'd like to wrap that up. We we opened the door and never closed it. Um, mm -hmm. it, it I started okay, to say I second about driving. Driving uh, for people who are practiced well, users well, of cannabis, well, driving doesn't hurt. And in Colorado, driving death, actual death from driving, has declined. Well, uh, look, I, I, what I wanted to do was uh, to to draw the delineation because what I opened the door to, I think, uh, before you called was. The idea that what is impairment, and yeah. so um, with alcohol, you've been able to determine uh, medically that uh, everybody's affected the same way. Once you've reached a certain level in your bloodstream, that uh, you're impaired, and so they recognize this uh, from a stamp. You know, most of the states have uh, a per se limit on alcohol for that very reason. It's tied mm -hmm. to impairment. Now, uh, with uh, medical cannabis, um, let me ask first our our, our guest on the program um, that. Uh, you know, do you see a difference? Uh, have you been uh, exposed to any information about the idea that because, number one, if yeah. you ingest marijuana, that um, yeah. it's going to be yeah. present in your system long after it any, has any psychoactive effect, but then also that uh, somebody might be able to have a tolerance that doesn't make them impaired, and should you be measuring impaired driving based on actual impairment rather than a per se notification, which is different, uh, and doesn't kind of apply to marijuana from a medical standpoint. From the science, doesn't support the same thing that alcohol does in a per se situation. Uh, can you answer that, Mr. Chipman? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Should we have a test with a certain number of nanograms being, uh, you know, impairment? And should there be serious, harsh penalties for that? Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, there's been some experiments with it, with so a, pin, a, a pinprick test and things like that. Obviously, the government and the law enforcement, they're, they're, they need to catch up. They're behind uh, in getting uh, prepared for this. 
And that's one of the reasons why we shouldn't legalize it until we've got full preparation. We should have a blood test. We should have a level at which the, at the, if you're over this number of nanograms, then you are impaired. Um, but what about somebody who's built a, a what lie. about what about somebody who's though built a tolerance to marijuana because they're taking it on a daily basis and they're not you impaired the same with thing about alcohol. No, no well, that's not people no. who, who uh, have a tolerance to alcohol. Absolutely. There's people no. who function at a very high level who are alcoholics. Chuck Ream. That's true. That is true. There are alcoholics who function at a high level, although the comparison of the two is completely false. Alcohol causes a diminution in your capabilities. Uh, cannabis doesn't necessarily cause a diminu- diminution in your driving ability. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's and in my many point, cases, right? And it, once you're it, a driver under the influence of cannabis, you don't think you drive poorly. But the tests you, are but the, you the, but the statistics say, the data says that you leave more space between your car and the car ahead of you, and you also drive <laughs> at a slow speed. Okay, let me give you one more test. Uh, some airline pilots were given uh, a significant amount of alcohol and another group uh, marijuana, uh, and they were put in uh, flight simulators. And then, uh, of course, they said, you know, you know you're going to land this plane. Of course, none of them could do it. Next morning, the same group came in, and the people, the pilots that were used uh, alcohol the night before passed the test. Those who were under the influence of marijuana the night before did not pass the test. Long, so, what, there, you know, there are long-lasting impacts of marijuana, and you know people don't recognize their own impairment. You see a guy driving down the side of the road who's uh, drunk. They drive slow. They drive off to the side. You know, they, it, it, cops pick them up. They're they're very easily. They they see them. Uh, people and they know they're impaired. A lot of marijuana drivers, they don't, they think they're driving great, and they're not. Chuck, do you have a response to that with what you've what you you've been exposed to? All right, anything related related to driving has to be related to impairment. Any number that you put on your blood uh, limit is just a police tool, a true tool of fascism to put people in jail, uh, because so many of us live all day long, every day of our lives, with our blood at far above that limit and so therefore would be culpable would be would have harsh penalties as the gentleman says here for having our blood in its usual daily uh, state uh, i'm talking about how i wake up in the morning i'm sure it's above that level so yeah it's i think truly that's an ridiculous and driving, and driving is so important that you really do have to relate to impairment i'm sorry mr uh, Ch- uh chipman you yeah, are you... I say that means so the fact that you can't determine whether someone's impaired or not by the by a chemical test of the amount of THC in their system is another reason that we should not legalize it. Well, I mean, couldn't you no, couldn't you just use an uh, I mean, couldn't you just use an impairment test the same way they did with alcohol before the per se limit? Where... Oh, you know, touch your nose or walk a line. Well, sure. If you're impaired, yeah, it would sure. be it would be visible. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not opposed to that. I, it, you know and. The drug driving thing is an issue. You know, the driving deaths are down in Colorado, but deaths where one of the or more of the drivers were under the influence of marijuana is up. So, and, you know, we, there's a lot of other health impacts besides drugs and driving. Of course, drug driving is a, is a serious concern because it impacts people who are not using. But we've got the edibles who are, you know, a lot of people uh, have seriously negative impacts as a result of the edibles. Uh, it's very easy to overdose. Uh, we just had a guy jump out of a third-story building of his home. His mother gave him a cookie. We had, of course, the student, a uh, foreign exchange student who jumped off a fourth-story to his death uh, from a hotel room in Colorado. We had a husband who came home and just after eating some marijuana candy, threatening to kill himself, and chose not to kill himself, but instead chose to kill his wife. Oh, wait a minute. Now, wait we a minute. have wait. psychotic breaks all the time in fair, uh, in, related to marijuana. In fairness, though, Mr. Chipman, I, I mean, a lot of these stories I'm familiar with uh, just from background. Um, a lot of these people were impaired not only by marijuana, but other things. And wouldn't, I mean, aren't we just really talking about a slice of society that is a little bit crackpotty? Um, and you're just pointing well, at the marijuana to there? Well, the families of these people, the most, this guy from uh, uh Africa, who he had had no drug experience at all. He was not a uh, a mental case. 
uh, this ki- uh, kid just shot himself. Uh, his parents, he from Missouri in Colorado, went on a ski vacation and shot himself. And his family said the fake. They blame the marijuana 100%. They said this kid had no problems, no depression, no psychotic issues, and uh, and they, you know they're so yeah. It's all anecdotal, yeah. But you add it all up, and you and you you, you look at the science of marijuana. And it, it's got serious concerns. We should not legalize. We should study it, uh, get the use the science. We don't need another addictive drug in our society that's not under uh, good FDA and doctor. Uh, control. I want to ask, haven't we studied this enough, or, or has it been possible to do the studies, the type of studies under American <laughs> law that you're talking about? That's what I want to ask, but before I do, I want to ask um, uh, Chuck Ream if he's got anything else to say before uh, uh, before he's off the program. Well, it's very important that we label edibles properly. People have to know that edibles can be very dangerous because you're getting, you may get more into your body than you're used to and you've got to titrate the dose, you've always got to start with a very small amount. We're back to the problem, though, of somebody who's not used to it uh, taking too much, and then, yes, they can have a problem. So edibles are a potential danger. They've got to be uh, labeled and used very carefully, but they're absolutely essential for people who can't or don't want to smoke. So it's probably... Yeah, I appreciate it's... his honesty on that. Yeah, no, I, I do, too. Um uh, would you say, so you, we are both in agreement, both uh, our guest and our caller are in agreement that uh, marijuana edibles have issues, uh, but also are important? Well, I don't, well, the FDA process is important. The, the edibles have issues, the fact that edibles have issues, and people say, oh, well, I, you know, like I said, this is the snake oil of the 21st century. We have no potency, no frequency, no testing, no duration, no fo- doctor follow-up visits. Uh, you know, we need, if marijuana is going to be considered by, a, by many, like this gentleman, as a medicine, they should be the first ones advocating for the medicine to go through the FDA process because I would think everyone would want to be using safe doses and not just be trusting the bud tender. Uh, Chuck, don't you think that the, not- F- is the FDA process, has it been open and available in, in, in history? Is it still open and available now? Everyone knows that it takes millions of dollars and a major funder to get through the FDA process. This is a plant that should be treated as an herb, and it was used in America up until uh, the first part of uh, the 20th century, and no one even mentioned that it got you high. They didn't even care. A medicine was supposed to make you feel better. It, It did that. And the gentleman here mentioned snake oil, and that's my wife used to say that 10 years ago. And now we realize, yup, it really is kind of like a snake oil medicine because it is a regulator. It's, a, it's not an upper. It's not a downer. It's a regulator of almost every system in the body. So if you wanted to call it snake oil, well, great, because it's almost like that since it regulates all the various systems, even blood formation, even bone formation. You know, the, formation. the interesting thing is if, if, if marijuana could get through the FDA process or some components of marijuana could, and some have, right? Sativex, Marinol, there's others, Epidiolex. There are drugs that have gone through the FDA process. Well, but but it, but yes. Sativex hasn't gone through the FDA process yet. It's currently in clinical trials in this country, but the, mm-hmm. medical, reasoning, the, the medical reasoning behind the, uh, the study was never done in America because uh, the FDA wouldn't allow it. Uh, they had to go to uh, Israel to do that study. Well, my my uh, my point is, if somebody could make money on this, legitimately, you think that they would not spend the time to get their drug approved? Of course, they are, they were going to do that to make money. That's their goal: is to say, "Hey, here's an effective treatment for stomach nausea," and they are going to do that because they know they can make money to doing it. So, you know, we we got to right. use the FDA process. And you say, "Well, nobody wants to do it, really." Absolutely. And we've had drugs out there. Opium, for example, has been out there for thousands of years. And, of course, it's been used and abused. And you can use and abuse marijuana, I admit to that. But you also have to realize that the marijuana today is 20 times stronger. The low-dose marijuana is 20 times stronger than the 70s. So, you know, it's not the same marijuana that you're talking about people used for thousands of years. It's been hybridized over and over and over again. It's be stronger and stronger and stronger. Uh, well, would uh, there... uh, uh, Go ahead, I can Chuck. answer those. 
Go ahead. Go ahead, Chuck. Well, it's a little bit stronger. It clearly is stronger. Yes, it is stronger, probably maybe twice as strong. Although in the old days, if you got Colombian, if you got Acapulco gold, if you got Panama red, it would be basically as strong as today's stuff. There's been very strong stuff all the way back into the history of India. Um, in terms of this, uh, the components of pot, yes, the big companies who want to make a lot of money are very seriously studying every one of the cannabinoids. And the get this, the majority of research on cannabinoids in the United States is done uh, with synthetic cannabinoids, single cannabinoids on animals. And... Uh, uh, so they're looking for a way to make money, and until they can find a way to make a lot of money, uh, they're not going to allow us, they're going to try to stop us from providing the simple herb that has helped people for so many thousands of years on many continents. Uh, let me ask Virtually you... Virtually all drugs are synthetic these days, and that's the way you get a drug that you can make over and over and over again and know it's going to be the same. You've got total control over it. Uh, and so it, that's just the, that's just the smartest way to do it. Figure out what the uh, components are and synthesize it. That's normal. Are you familiar uh, with the, no. the completely different reaction? Uh, Mr. Chipman, are you familiar with Dr. Sanjay Gupta and his argument about medical marijuana and why he changed his mind about it? Well, I know um, I've watched the TV shows. Sure. And uh, he uses a lot of anecdotal evidence, but. The CBD oil and, um, and you know, there have been tests with CBD oil, and the, 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 the results are mixed. You know, he has definitely, uh, I think, uh, taken a non-scientific approach to this. It's, it's virtually all of his, his observations are anecdotal and not scientific. Um, and my concern is that, you know, you, you can always find somebody who can say, I feel so much better when I do this or that. It's still, you have to use the science. You have to have double-blind studies. You have to also measure the, the, uh, the negative impacts along with the positive impacts and make sure that the positives outweigh the, ne the negatives. So, uh, sorry, I, I don't have a lot of respect for his observations because I think he's thrown out the science with the with his desire to be cool and, and uh, you know, hip on this issue. Well, it seems like he did a lot I of research. Your, I beg your pardon, sir. The, the, the positive is, is right there. If you look at the science, you would want the actual science of the situation. If you're sending your teenager out on the weekend, you would want them to have marijuana because marijuana, in terms of the data, produces more cautious behaviors. And then okay. marijuana also protects brains protects brain cells against damage by alcohol. Are you, so, are you familiar with Bertha Modris? Yeah, really. Okay, so as a parent, I should Bertha, want yeah, my son not. and daughter to go out smoking marijuana on Friday. I, I thank you for making my point. Well, there we go. So I, I was I was asking about the, uh, the, the, the familiarity with uh, Dr. Gupta because I've had him on the program. Um, well, I'll, I'll give you a suggestion. Get Bertha Madras, who's a brain biologist from Harvard University, who's been studying marijuana for thirty plus years, and she, she's I nuts. Could, I could. She's nuts. <laughs> she's just nuts. Well, look, I, I, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to. Look, I, I don't, let me just be clear. I don't want to attack anybody. I, I, I don't well, want anybody Steve, to attack anyone. I'm, I'm. I hate to say it, but you're. You know, I mean, he's he's got some reasonable points, but I think he's making my point better than he than he is his own. Bertha Madras, a brain biologist from Harvard University, who's got uh, her credentials are three pages long. She is she he describes her as nuts because she doesn't agree with his drug of choice. Chuck Bertha is a paid uh, paid and, fashion. Oh, Sanjay Gupta is anyway, not being paid. Just... But, well, I don't think Sanjay Gupta is being paid no, by Sanjay by Gupta's, it. He's an he's an independent he's thinker. Paid. He's a reporter. And and Bertha Madras does a lot of brain studies that are not related to marijuana. She's not being paid to be uh, some kind of a uh, just just to dis, just to to describe the negative impacts of marijuana. She does scientific studies. She's one of the most well respected. She's certainly a much more well respected uh, scientist than Sanjay Gupta. But anyway, that, my that's point all is you can get a grant on. for. Ask her these questions. So, so let me. Uh, the reason I brought up Dr. Gupta is because we were talking about 
you know, FDA trials and making sure it gets double blind studied and all this kind of stuff. Right. And uh, we then you mentioned the idea that uh, the many of the studies um, are with synthetic versions of this, so it, it didn't include. No, I said he. The, the premise was made that uh, a lot of the. I didn't say that. He said it that they're that they're using synthetic marijuana. Okay, so, so the synthetic. That was... But that's the way you know. There are a huge. I'm not even sure it's not most of the drugs that are pharmaceutical these days are not synthetic. Well, what, what I'm drawing the, your attention to is the idea that uh, Dr. Sure. Gupta had explained that the reason, one of the reasons that medicine has a hard time making, uh, or, or science has a hard time of making a medicine out of cannabis, is because of what he labeled the entourage effect. And the entourage effect uh, explains about the idea that this is a whole plant medication and not something that you can break down into its components because each of the components plays a role. Yeah, and I'm not saying, you know, I could say I've got, I'm going to be using medical bourbon tonight, you know. I, it makes me feel better. I'm not saying that it doesn't make you feel better, and it's, some people feel some palliative effects. I'm just saying that does not make it a medicine. Uh, Chuck, uh, anything? It's a regulator. It's a regulator. Well, it is. A, well, he just talked about the human endocannabinoid system, which is a recent discovery. He said it was something that he didn't learn in medical school, but it's now being brought out. Uh, in medical journals, the endocannabinoid system as a regulator, as you're speaking to. Well, yeah, it's also an addictive, every, every, it's an addictive substance as well. Chuck? So, well, if you can become addicted, if you can become addicted to it, then I have become uh, addicted to it. I've tried for 50, well, 48 years as hard as possible to become addicted to it. Uh, I've checked a few times. You know, I've gone off it for a month or a few weeks and just checked it. I've never... Uh, it's never seemed to be addictive when I've gone off of it. But if you could get addicted, I'm addicted, and I'm so productive, and I've got these three degrees. I've been elected five times. I've been a kindergarten teacher, function at a very, very high level, who enjoy cannabis rather than alcohol. Well, and much, uh, much whoa, like... Whoa, 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 whoa. You enjoy can I thought you were using it for stomach ailments. Absolutely. I use it for spirituality as well, to bring me yeah, closer okay. to God, yeah, if you can understand. understand that sort of a concept. Yeah, I'm a very religious person, but I don't think, I think drugs inhibit our free agency. They don't, ex, uh, they don't take, they don't increase our free agency. I think it's based They most you know, certainly do. You, you, My goodness, you, you try to tell me you can't, <laughs> you're going to take LSD and you're not going to increase the flexibility of your thinking? Or, or okay. marijuana, and you're not going to All right. increase the depth. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm, I'm noting this. Teens should be using marijuana when they go out on the weekends <laughs> and LSD. See, this is this is why <laughs> we're opposed to Just it. Check it. Google it. Okay. Yeah. Google the LSD it. expands check the mind. It. Hey, man, I, I graduated from high school in 1970. I know LSD well. I know. I I had uh, friends dropping acid uh, regularly and. Uh, yeah, I mean, so the, the, like, and, and like, it, if, uh, yeah. if marijuana should be legalized, then why not LSD? It expands the mind. It Absolutely. It the yeah, there. So, I agree. So then we would have more people. Is uh, that this is all about the 100% legalization of all drugs for any reason at any time, any purpose. And just, that's a dangerous, we, that's a very dangerous direction for us uh, on a as a country. Go, uh, one more, one more chance for you, uh, uh, Chuck. And then on a closing note, because we've already gone, I've blown out a commercial break, and we're already over time on the program. I'm just trying to get to the end of this year. But uh, on a closing note, what do you got to say, Chuck? Oh, just uh, if we had uh, more LSD, we might have more people like Steve Jobs. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I thought this was I about think, marijuana, uh, not LSD. We've proven our point it's the very same well. Thing. In, in terms of marijuana, it's completely benign, and it is proving to be a great help with for older older folks as well. Our last demographic that we need to conquer. Thank you very much. Thank, th you. thank you, Chuck. What's for, the uh, natural plant that LSD comes from? Your call has ended. Oh, that's okay. Sorry, we lost Chuck. He hung up. <laughs> He's no, so, I'm just, I'm just being facetious, right? So, <laughs> but I, okay. you know, I appreciate you, him being on because it's the, it's the perfect, it, you know, it's perfect exposure. Teens should be using marijuana because it, it makes them safer drivers and more responsible and more careful. And LSD should be legalized because it's mind expanding and religious. So, uh, Chuck Green is what you're saying made your point for you. He did. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Scott Chipman, 
from Calm out in San Diego, California. Thank you for coming on the program and explaining this side of things for us. We appreciate it. And your, uh, any listeners who are concerned about legalization of marijuana should contact us. Uh, thank you so much. We'll see you next time for another edition of The Full Melt Show. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye. The Full Melt Show is a production of TFM Media.